because we've identified her as one of the, the really the leaders out there on tax and budget issues across the country. So thank you, Delegate Bates, for your service uh, and appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to introduce my uh, legislative assistant, Katie Sikinolfi, who's with us today, also from ALEC. Uh, Katie, do you want to come up and say a couple of words? Thanks so much for inviting us to come out today. And I just wanted to give you a little bit more information about what ALC is and what we do. We're the nation's largest individual membership organization of state legislators that share a common commitment to the ideals of federalism, free markets, and individual liberty. Um, we serve as a resource for state legislators to help them fight the good fight in the states. You can check out our website at www.alec.org. Um, one of the other things that we do is our Rich States Poor States project, basically highlighting the policies that help states become more successful in their economies and looking at the policies that kind of prevent states from achieving economic prosperity. So I encourage you to look at our website, valid.org, and Jonathan will tell you a little bit more about Rich States Poor States and how Maryland is doing this year. Well, I've got good news and bad news for you this evening. The bad news is uh, Maryland is not a rich state, unfortunately, when it comes to our rankings, and uh, especially with the new tax increases that were recently passed. I mean, what's the definition of insanity again? You keep doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. Uh, what, a couple of years ago, what is it, two, three years ago, not longer than that, that we experimented uh, with the uh, income tax increase on millionaires or whatever they wanted to define it as and failed miserably, wrote about it extensively in past editions of Rich States, Poor States, and then here again, I, it was deja vu all over again, and I see the Maryland legislature getting ready to raise taxes again. Uh, I tell you what, it is uh, the people like Delegate Bates and Delegate Mike Huff, who's our ally chairman for, for Maryland, uh, they're fighting the good fight out there. Unfortunately, they're a little bit outnumbered. But what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight is what's going on across the other states. How does Maryland stack up? I'll tell you, we were just on Capitol Hill yesterday doing an event with Senator Rand Paul uh, from Kentucky and Senator Mike Lee from Utah. And, uh, you know, it's good to be among friends tonight because up there on Congress, you know, their approval ratings, I think about 10% right now after the U.S. Congress. It's unbelievable. I think they just have Fidel Castro beat in terms of approval ratings at this point. <laughs> and I heard the other day, though, that uh, while they might have the influenza virus beat on popularity, the influenza virus is gaining. So unfortunately, <laughs> that's where we are with Congress these days. The beauty about what I do is work with the states, though. And so while we do have a program with Congress. We have about 100 members of Congress who are members of ours. Our prime focus at ALEC is being a conservative free market group of state legislators. And that's how I've gotten to know Delegate Bates. We work in every single state capital. We have more than 2,000 legislative members from across the 50 states. There's a reason, folks, that uh, the far left activists like the Occupy people and Van Jones and the other have been coming after us. You may have seen you know, some of their attacks in the news coming after us, talking about us being a, a dangerous conservative organization. Well, you know, if that's what they accuse us of, I'm okay being a dangerous conservative organization because if you look at the things we believe in, they're the things that most Americans believe in. Transparency in government, free markets, limited government, federalism. You know, this thing of federalism has really gotten warped in Washington, D.C. You know, when you talk about federalism sometimes, people say, oh, isn't that how much the federal government can take over things? No, 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 not at all. You know, in D.C., we talk about Obamacare nationalizing the fifth of our economy. We talk about, you know, the federal government taking more and more from the free market and from the states. It's a big problem. But, you know, we believe in the original definition of federalism, which is those things not expressly given to the federal government. And there's something like 19 specifically enumerated powers in the United States Constitution given to the federal government. And you know what? After that, our founders said, that's it for the federal government. The rest of it goes back to the states and the people of the states. And boy, we've gone from 19 enumerated programs to about 19 million programs out there, and we need to get that under control. That's something that we're fighting for at ALEC. That's what we believe in, limited government, free markets. And then the final principle that we, as a core relief of ours, is lower taxes. And that's what this publication is all about. And that is the tax issue is the one issue, I think, that really unifies the conservative right of center base across the country. We may disagree on some social issues, we may disagree on other issues, but when it comes to taxes, 
generally the, the right of center America, which is probably that Reagan coalition that was developed, you know, 60, 70 percent of Americans generally think they're either center or right. Those are the people who believe in lower taxes. And this is a guide, rich states, poor states is a guide to show why lower taxes matter, not just the ideological background of it, but why across our 50, as Justice Brandeis would say, 50 laboratories of democracy. We have now a good half century worth of pretty reliable data to say that the states that keep taxes low and can keep government limited have better success than the states that take the tax and spend approach. You know, this isn't about our belief versus the Paul Krugmans of the world and the liberal economists belief. This is about raw facts. And on the other side may say, well, Alex is a conservative organization, so don't listen to him. Folks, this is from the U.S. Census Bureau, most of the data from in rich states, poor states. The U.S. Census Bureau is not a right-wing think tank. They play it pretty straight up the middle. And the data is clear. Now, the way that states get around this, because there's no way to avoid the laws of economics. When you raise a price of something, like a tax does or a regulation does, you're going to get less of it. Now, the way that the left-wing tax and spend states get around this is, oh, well, yeah, we know that it's going to be bad, but we'll pay favorites and we'll say, you know, this particular company or this particular industry, if you guys cozy up to us uh, left-wing politicians, we'll give you a nice little carve-out and a special little deduction and, and credit uh, for your industry just so you can kind of be okay. We know taxes are going to be high, but you play with us and we'll, we'll try to rub your back, you rub ours kind of deal. And that's really the last part of Reagan's uh, comment was, if it stops moving altogether, which happens when taxes get too high, you start subsidizing it. And that is a direct, and it's in a way, a very cronyist type policy where we see this thing going on across the country in terms of states that have gotten it wrong on taxes. They just start picking winners and losers through tax policy. And it's a very dangerous thing. You know, who here wants to see more salanders out there across the country? I mean, that was a debacle, right, in, in Washington. But in the states, we're playing those type of games all the time. And I know Maryland is pretty good at that game of raising taxes on everybody. And then the politically favored industries or companies, they get a nice little wink and a nod, and they know their taxes are going to go down, down the road. But what we think, and what I think most Americans probably in just term of fairness would say, is that we ought to just tax everybody at the same rate. You know, it shouldn't be based on political favoritism, who gets taxed at what rate. That's, that's a pretty bedrock principle of tax policy. And if we go through a couple of slides, um, I wanted to just talk a little bit through some of the findings of rich states, poor states this year. Uh, we can go through to a couple of the slides. We could probably skip the first one since that's the about the Alex slide. Um, and talk about um, a few of the things today. I want to talk about spending. I want to talk about taxes. And then I want to talk about something else, which has been getting some ink lately, but I think is the number one financial issue facing states today, and that is pensions, the unfunded liabilities and public pensions for state and local workers. Now, if you ask me, I think there's a really a war going on out there, and the war is between the private sector and the public sector. And as we have larger and larger public sector uh, wages, benefits, the growth of the public sector, and crowds out the private sector because they pay for it at the state level. We don't have any luxury at the state level of printing presses like we do in Washington, D.C. And that's probably a good thing because certain states like Maryland, if they had printing presses, you would be in a whole lot worse shape than you are. Uh, that's that's, a, that's one of the, the deals that we have to just put up with at the state level. We don't have printing presses. The other thing is 48 out of the 50 states have a constitutional or some sort of law saying you must balance your budget. Boy, we haven't even passed a budget in Washington, D.C. at the federal government level for about three years now. We haven't passed a budget, uh, and you know, let alone balance it. We've been at least a trillion dollars out of whack at the national level every year that we have uh, spent money. We've been spending is out of control at the Washington, uh, D.C. level. Um, and so because of those factors, though, basically at the state level, spending is taxes. So as you spend more, you're going to need to pay for it somehow at the state level. And as the really this, this conflict between the private and the public sector gets deeper, we've had a pretty difficult decade over the last uh, 10 years in terms of our economy. In fact, folks, believe it or not, this economic recovery, if you want to call it that, since 2008, has been the slowest economic recovery in our nation's history after an economic downturn like we faced in 2008. What this means is, 
the state recovery is going to be delayed. Generally, when a federal government, when we, our economy at the national level required, starts to recover, the state economies take a couple of years after that to really catch up. Now, this is especially visible here in Maryland. As I understand now, this last month, you were the state that lost the most jobs out of any state in the country. Now, I don't know if there's a coincidence or not there with the tax increase happening, because that just happened. But I'll tell you what, people predict future behavior in markets. So they, if they think a tax increase is going to be coming, which I think most educated observers would say, Maryland's probably going to raise taxes this year, they start pulling some of their capital and some of their business out of that state in, anticip in anticipation of that change. And so it's very real that you could already start to be seeing the effects of that tax increase, even though it's just been voted on. Now, I would say you probably expect more of the same. In some degree, Maryland's been insulated from the national downturn because of some of the federal government jobs that are located here. So is Virginia, for that matter. And we're going to talk about Maryland versus Virginia a little bit later.